Hello everyone. In part one of the video, we discussed basic objects, how to configure their parameters. We talked about variables and variable scope, as well as interfaces and containers. Let's continue where we left off from part one by discussing a new object called switches. In part one of the video, we looked at knobs and faders. Now those controls we saw have a variable called x. And x refers to a single value, that is, the value of the fader, or the knob. We refer to this type of value as a scalar, because it only has one value. The switches control, on the other hand, can have either one value, or can have multiple values, as we'll see. Notice in the switch's properties that we can configure columns and rows for the switch. Let's try changing this to five columns to see the effect. As you can see, this essentially creates five switch controls that we can use. By holding down on the E key, we can click on each control to turn it on or off. But let's examine the variables and see how this works. Notice that I've only got a single X variable, but I actually have five switches. So how are we going to access or make changes to the values of our switches if we only have a single variable? To understand this, let's make use of the monitor, just like we did in part one. Let's create one monitor for the switches and one monitor for the fader. I'm going to copy and paste this monitor. Let's configure this switch to be a one by one for now. Then we'll change it back to five by one in just a moment. We'll rename this to be switches monitor and this to be fader monitor. Now the switches monitor, we want to refer to the value of the switches object. In the last video, we saw that we could just place switches.x, the name of our switches x variable, in this box. Let's do the same thing for the fader. In this case, we'll type fader.x. The switches monitor really doesn't need any precision, since every switch only has a 0 or 1 value. For the fader, we'll change it to 2. Alright, so let's change our switch on and off and see what the monitor shows us. I'm holding E on my keyboard. Clicking on the switch, we see that it changes to a 1 and back down to 0. As we saw in the last video, the fader goes from 0 to 1 smoothly as well. So the way we have things currently configured, it looks like there's no difference between a switch and a fader. And it's true that when a switch's object only has a single switch configured, they do behave very much the same. But now, let's change our switches back to a 5x1 and see what the monitor shows us. As you can see, the monitor now has five values displayed, surrounded by braces, and separated by commas. We call this a vector. Each digit of the vector represents one of our switch values. We can easily see this by turning on or off particular switches. There we see the first one change to a 1, now the middle one, now the fourth one, fifth one, second one. So you can easily see that a vector is simply a collection of multiple values. Now internally, each switch has a number associated with it, and that's called the index of the switch. We can see the indices by turning on numbers. Notice that they're labeled 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. When we want to talk about a value contained in an object which stores its values in a vector, we start by counting with the number 0, 1, 2, 3, then 4. In order to see how we refer to each individual value of a switch's object, for example, let's create one monitor per switch. I'm going to just copy and paste this monitor a few times. We'll get these arranged after we configure them. So in order to refer to a single value within a vector, we would type open brackets and then the number of the index that we want. So let's start with 0. As you can see, what we have now is a scalar value. That's because the value of switch 0 is actually a scalar, and we have multiple scalars stored in a vector. Let's go ahead and configure the rest of these. Here we'll type 1, 
two, three, and four. Let's also name these switch one, two, three, four, and five. I'll move the fader over. And get these switches adjusted. All right, so now when we enable or disable individual switches, we'll see that the monitors below display the values of the individual switches, whether on with a 1 or off with a 0. Now let's create another object that we haven't seen yet called LEDs. LEDs are configured by turning their light either on or off. Technically, the values range from negative 2 to 2, but we'll use 0 and 1 for now. You can see the LED is now on. Notice how just as with the switches object, we had a rows and columns option. We have that same option for LEDs. Let's change it to 5, just as we've done for the switches. I'll separate them a bit so it's easier to tell one LED from the next. Notice how we have a 1 set for our light, and that that 1 is getting applied to all of our LEDs. If we change it back to a 0, similarly, they'll all go off. Just as with switches, the LED values can be specified using a vector. Let's say we only want the first, third, and fifth LED to be on. We start by typing open brace, 1, comma, for our first LED, 0 for the second, 1 for the third, 0 for the 4th, and 1 for the 5th, followed by a closed bracket. When we click off the object, it gets updated and we can now see the 1st, 3rd, and 5th LED turned on. If we specify fewer than the number of LEDs that are actually configured for the object, it simply repeats the pattern. In this case, if we typed just 1 and 0, followed by a closed brace, we see that our result is the same because it's repeating the pattern of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, etc. If we were to make this a 5x5 five five set of LEDs instead, you can see that the pattern continues down the line. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, etc. Let's change this back to a 5x1. So we've seen that an LED is configured using a vector. What if we wanted to have each of these switches control a single LED? Well, there's two ways we could accomplish this. One way would be by building a vector manually using each of the indices of the switch. We said that the first switch can be referred to as X bracket 0. So here we could type switches.x0 comma, switches.x1, comma, etc. And finally, a closed brace at the end. All of our LEDs have gone dark because none of our switches are enabled. If I hold E and turn on switches, we see that the LEDs also get enabled as expected. But in this case, there's an easier way to configure it. We saw a while ago that all we need to type for LEDs is an open brace followed by a value for each LED. Well, that looks very similar to what we see in our switches monitor up above. If we look back, the switches monitor is currently referring to the value of x, which is a vector. This means all we really need to type here is switches.x. Now we get the same behavior as when we built up the vector ourselves from scratch, but it's much simpler to configure. If we wanted, we could create a monitor for the LEDs to display their light values. Let's copy and paste the existing monitor. Instead of referring to switches.x, let's refer to LEDs 
dot light. Notice that the value remains the same. As we turn the switches on and off, the value of LEDs dot light reflects the same vector as is present on the switches object. So in summary, some objects are simple, just contain a single scalar value, and others are a bit more complex by containing multiple scalar values bundled into a vector. But it's easy to refer to each individual value of a vector by using brackets as we've seen. It's also possible to refer to the entire vector value by simply referring to the variable or property. All right, now that you understand vectors and scalars and how to reference each individual value within a vector, we can begin to do some more interesting things. Let's start just by moving some of these things to the side. We don't have to delete them because they're still useful. I'll move these up. All right, let's say that we would like for this set of switches to control five different faders and maybe each switch we'd like to enable or disable the grid setting for the fader so that we could easily enable or disable the grid setting. Let's start off by creating five faders. I'll copy and paste this fader several times. I'll rename the first fader to fader1 to keep the naming consistent. Alright, the first thing we want to do is decide on a grid setting. Maybe we want to be able to choose between 10 different values from 0 to 10. In that case we would need a grid setting of 11. Let's make sure we chose the right setting by enabling the label, the value, and the grid in order to test our results. 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 1.0. Alright, that looks good. We can go ahead and enable the label and the value for all of our faders. I don't think we need these individual switch monitors anymore, so let's get rid of them. And let's move this a little bit closer, just to help see what we're doing. Finally, let's disable the grid setting on this first fader. Okay, so each fader is set to a grid of 11, but the grid is disabled. And like we said, we'd like each of these switches to enable or disable the grid setting on each of these faders. Now your first thought might be, well, let's just click on a fader, go to the grid box, and somehow use the fader's x variable to accomplish what we're talking about. But that's really not possible because there's no field in which we could specify any equation for enabling or disabling the grid. The best place to turn for this sort of answer is, of course, the manual. If you refer to section 12.4 of the manual, you'll see the details of the fader. And if we scroll down, if we scroll way down, we'll get to the attributes section. Now notice here that we have an attribute called grid. It has a value of 0 or 1, which is what makes it perfect for use in conjunction with a switches object. And it simply turns the grid off or on. If you refer to appendix 2 in the manual, and scroll up to the top of the page, you'll see a section called Object Attributes. It says Object Attributes are editable via the Set Attribute function. Let's go ahead and copy this for reference. So this is our first opportunity to make a script. Let's click on the Switches object and then click the Script button. Now we'll need to create a separate script per fader that we wish to control. So let's name them appropriately. In this case, Fader 1 Grid. Now since this is our first look at scripts, let's take just a moment to talk about this pop-up because it controls when a script gets executed. You can see that the default is manual, and that means that we would need to use another script to call this script if we left this setting as is. There are several options in here, and we'll get to them over time, but the one that we're going to use right now is called onExpression. So what does onExpression mean? Each time we make a change to a value, whether it's a fader, or a switch. Internally that object's variables get triggered. In the case of fader objects whose x variables are simply scalars, we would always refer to the value changing as being x. However, because with switches the x variable actually represents five different values, we have a choice. If we'd like for our script to be triggered whenever any of the switches are pressed, then we would simply type x in the box here. If, on the other hand, we would like for this script to only trigger 
when a particular switch gets pressed, we would use the same bracket format as we have previously by typing x bracket 0. This means this script will only get executed when our first switch is either enabled or disabled. The little pop-up over on the right hand side of the script window actually determines what type of change is needed for the script to get executed. Currently it's set to execute if there's any change to this variable. However, if we wanted to, we could set it to only trigger when the value goes up, for example, when a switch gets turned on, but not when it gets turned off. Or we could do the opposite. We could have the script trigger only when the switch gets turned off, but not when it gets turned on. We'll cover the rest of these values over time, but for now we'll leave it at any, because in our case, when the switch is turned on, we want the grid setting to be turned on, and when the switch is turned off, we want the grid setting to be turned off. So clearly we want this script to trigger whenever we turn the switch on or off. All right, now let's get down to the script itself. The script is very simple. Unfortunately, Lemur quit on me, so I've had to recreate this from scratch. Let's keep going. We're going to use the function that we talked about earlier from the manual called set attribute. We'll type set attribute, open parentheses. Now we want to put the name of the object whose attribute we want to change. In this case, it's fader1 and comma. Next, we want to type the name of the attribute that we want to change. As we saw earlier, it's just called grid. The third value that set attribute is expecting is either a 1 or a 0 for the grid setting. For now, let's just type a 1. This won't work exactly like we want it to, but we'll make a change in a few minutes. I'd like to use 1 to keep it from being confusing up front. Let's press close parentheses and semicolon and we're done. Now if we hold down the E key and click the zero, our grid setting is enabled. We can check and see that it works just as expected. And yes, it does. So that's great. We turned it on, but what about when we turn it off? Nothing happens. And that's obviously because the only action that this script is ever performing is turning on the grid setting and never turning it off. Now we could try and do something fancy in here that says if it's currently 1, then change it to a 0, or if it's currently 0, then change it to a 1, but that's really not necessary. We already have the value that we need contained in the x index 0. Let's think about it. And let's use the monitor as our diagnosis tool here. Currently, the value is 0, which means the value of x bracket 0 is 0. If I were to enable this, the value of x bracket 0 is now 1. Because the script is triggering each time we turn the switch either on or off, the value of x bracket 0 is the value that we actually want to use for our grid setting. When we turn the switch on, x bracket 0 is equal to 1. When we turn the switch off, x bracket 0 is equal to 0. Well, that's the exact behavior that we want this grid setting to be following. So instead of using a 1 in our script, we could replace this with x bracket 0. So now when we enable switch 0, our grid turns on, as it already was on. But when we click it again, it turns off. This makes sense, right? Because we're essentially telling the grid setting of the fader to be the same as the 1 or 0 on or off setting of the switch itself. Now if I try to click any of the other switches, currently it doesn't work. And that's because we've only created one script so far. So let's go ahead and copy what we've got and create a script for our second fader. This one we'll call fader2grid. Let's change our execution to on expression. This time we want to use x bracket 1 instead of x bracket 0 because we want the second fader to reflect the value of the second switch, which is index 1. I've pasted our set attribute function from the first script, but we need to make a couple of changes. First of all, the fader that we want to affect this time is fader 2. We still want to affect the grid attribute, so we can leave that alone. But the switch whose value that we want to reference in order to turn on or off the grid setting for fader number 2 is not x0, but x1. So this matches with this, which is what we want. Now if I hold E and click the second switch, index 1 on or off, we get the grid setting on, grid setting off, 
I'm going to go ahead and repeat this process for the rest of the switches. Alright, if you followed along, then you should now have fader 3 grid, show x2 here and here, and fader 3 here. Fader 4 grid should show x3 here and here, and fader 4 here. And fader 5 should show x4 here, x4 here, and fader 5 here. Let's test it out. So keep in mind that although we've used this technique to affect the grid setting of faders, we could really use this to affect any attribute which has a 1 or 0 value as options. Looking back at the attributes section of the fader in the manual, we can see that the capture attribute, the grid attribute, label, and value all have 0 or 1 as options. Scrolling down to other controls such as the knob, we see similar possibilities. Grid, label, the knob has a mode, either polar or linear, as well as value. So in this video we focused on scalar values, vectors, and we've had a look at a relatively simple script. The function that we used in this script, set attribute, is extremely useful and you'll use it very often in Lemur. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching.